One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey, everybody, it's the Sales Hacker Podcast, and you're listening to your host, Sam Jacobs. I hope wherever you are, you're doing well. I'm recording this from a nice place with green things and blue things around me. So I've managed to make it out of New York City as we bring you this great episode of the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, we've got Ernest Wusu. Ernest is the team lead and the SDR manager at a great company called Sixth Sense. And he's also, which is really interesting, a former professional football player for the NFL. And so this is a conversation about how to transition from a non-sales background into a sales career. It's a conversation about why diversity hiring is so important now more than ever. And it's also, frankly, a little bit of a conversation about football because I played football in high school. I love the sport, and yet it's still problematic when it comes to its impact on the human body. And so this is this is a really fantastic conversation that we're excited to have. Now, before we bring you this conversation, we want to thank our sponsors. We've got two sponsors on the show today. The first is Conga. Business is run on documents. Conga is changing the way the world works by modernizing, streamlining, and automating your documents, contracts, and processes to make it easier to do business. See why Conga is the number one paid app on the Salesforce App Exchange with a free trial or demo Today, you can go to conga.com to find out more. Our second sponsor, you know who they are. It's Outreach. Outreach is the number one sales engagement platform. They revolutionize customer engagement by moving away from siloed conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. Leveraging the next generation of artificial intelligence, the platform allows sales reps to deliver consistent, relevant, and responsible communication for each prospect every time, enabling personalization at scale that was previously unthinkable. Outreach produces industry-leading events like their Unleash Conference and their City by City Unleash Summit Series Roadshows, along with top-notch thought leadership content. Check them out at www.outreach.io. Now, without further ado, let's listen to my conversation with Ernest Owusu. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, we're excited to have Ernest Owusu, and he is the Senior Director of Sales Development at Sixth Sense. He, uh, if you don't know Sixth Sense, you should. They are, I, I guess you might call them an intent data or ABM orchestration platform. We are good friends with the CMO, Latney Conant, and we're excited to have Ernest on the show. Ernest leverages his passion for helping others succeed as well as his insights from the field to foster a winning team. With previous experience as an NFL athlete, Ernest thrives in team environments full of high collaboration and healthy competition. Outside of the office, you'll find him tackling the industry's diversity problem by mentoring and empowering underrepresented people so they can confidently grow their careers. Ernest, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And I guess awesome intro for you for that. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> well, uh, kudos to you for the accomplishments. So we know your name. We know your title, Senior Director of Business Development. In your words, mm-hmm. I think because that that specific title can mean uh, a few different things. Tell us both. Give us the elevator pitch on Sixth Sense because we want to make sure that you feel you get the opportunity to pitch the company. But also tell us specifically what you do in your role within Sixth Sense. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, kind of, I think you did an awesome job explaining what we do, but Sixth Sense is essentially an account-based orchestration platform where we help companies first uncover the accounts that want to essentially buy from them. Once they have that information, they then prioritize those accounts based upon uh, the various levels of intent that they're showing as well as predictive models. And then last but not least, uh, once you have that information, knowing exactly what to say to them to uh, get them to essentially get a meeting with you. It's uh it's been an awesome organization working with, seeing the results we've had with our customers and internally, because we personally use our own product, seeing how we've been able to generate pipeline with it. It's been, it's been phenomenal to be a part of the team, seeing how we've prog- how we progressed with that over the past couple of years. Um, but I kind of guess to go, go back. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, yeah. How long have you been there? Yeah, sure. I think so. I started, uh, I think it was back, it was about a year and some change. So, uh, early May, late April. Uh, but you okay. know, even in, yeah, but even in that, this time period, we've grown tremendously. Um, and obviously, you know, just some quick things to talk about six cents. We recently forced did an awesome evaluation over the ABM space and we were identified as a leader, which is super cool. Uh, I think kudos to not just our product team, but also our customers who've uh, been instrumental around the process, but you know, we're growing, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, personally it's awesome using the product. So I can't complain about it by any means. That's fantastic. So you have, you have a, a unique and interesting background to walk us through, you know, and I mentioned it in the, in the introduction, but 
first of all, you were in the NFL. So, so walk us through how you got to the NFL and, uh, because that's, that's an incredible journey and very difficult. And then how did you make it from the NFL all the way to being a a senior director of business development at Sixth Sense? Yeah. So that's a great question. And my journey to your point is very unique. Um, you know, I'm first generation. My parents are from Ghana and West Africa. So, um, when they came to America and kind of how I grew up in Tennessee, I had to learn a lot kind of on the fly because, you know, they weren't really a part of the process and uh, of just basically growing up in America. And football was something that just kind of stumbled across on me. It was, um, no one really told me to do it. It was just kind of something that I just, had for whatever reason random interest in it and then before i knew it i was pretty good at it i had the opportunity to go to cal uc berkeley and uh play there collegiately and then you know as i continue to get better and better refining my skills um i was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to have a career primarily playing with the minnesota vikings and Tampa bay buccaneers and when i tell you that experience was amazing but also probably one of the most stressful things i've ever gone through that would be a complete understatement but um, it, it was amazing. Like I never would have dreamed that I'd get that opportunity. And then when it became a reality, uh, seeing all the hard work come to fruition was um, something that, you know, I'll hold with me for the rest of my life. But yeah, it was, it was an awesome experience. How long were you in the, were you in the league? Yeah, sure thing. So I started out with the Vikings and the Bucks. I did that for about two years and I got hurt, um, really bad injury, which fortunately no chronic no chronic uh, issues anymore. And then after that, I kind of bounced around trying to find my way back into the NFL. But obviously, you know, kind of how that stuff goes is a little bit of damaged goods, if you want to call it, <laughs> because of what happened to me. And then, so I did that for a total of about three to four years. And then uh, when it was all said and done, I kind of just wrapped it up. And my, my big move after, and something that a lot of professional athletes struggle with is how can I find a way to parlay this unique skill that, you know, I was at such a high level into something completely unrelated, but still some related to what I was doing. And I will say it, it was definitely a challenge at first. I think a lot of people, especially, you know, BDRs, we kind of go through this whole career tr- uh, transition process. Just trying to figure out a way to make it happen was uh, challenging at first, but I got lucky, had some really great mentors and surprisingly saw a lot of good connections between being a professional athlete and being a BDR. And once I kind of realized that, they're actually very much one and the same. It was a no brand to make the job. How did you discover the world of being a BDR? What was the journey? Was it a series of network connections? Is there a mm-hmm. program that the NFL provides, you know, athletes as they're retiring and leaving the league or was it just sort of, you found your way on your own? Yeah. So the NFL has an, does an awesome job of this thing called the trust where they help transitioning athletes find a way to go on to their next career. That wasn't something that I took advantage of. For me, it was, you know, I went to school in Berkeley. I went to Berkeley and I was in the Bay Area. And it was a lot of just networking, grabbing coffee with people, trying to learn a little bit more what they're doing. And then one of my former teammates was uh, a BDR, I think, I forget what the company was called. But he was like, Ernest, I think you'd be awesome at this. And the challenging thing was with that is like, obviously, I went to Berkeley. It's a phenomenal school, great education. But I knew nothing about everything, <laughs> how you want to put it. And it was very intimidating being, being at a point where like, I barely knew what digital marketing was. I knew nothing about impressions. I knew nothing about sales. And just trying to find a way to jump into that was pretty scary. But fortunately, I had a friend in college who had gone through the process. He showed me the ropes around how to get recruited, how to, how to be effective in your first couple of months within the organization. And then once I kind of grasped my teeth around uh, like what it took for me to get there and, and kind of understand how I could succeed, the rest was history. What was the biggest specific shock when you joined the ranks of, you know, the, the, the global ranks of the sales development movement? What was the thing that surprised you the most that you hadn't expected when you finally got the job? Yes, yeah, sure. So other than the fact that I was doing a job where I wasn't getting paid to tackle people anymore, which is definitely <laughs> um, the, the biggest shock was how much of like a process environment it was in comparison to being an NFL athlete. Like if you're, if you're a really good, um, NFL athlete, or honestly, any kind of athlete together. What I've noticed historically is that the best professional athletes have the ability to know their strengths and make their strengths stronger than their weaknesses. And I started to realize that like I had, I had good tactics here and there around like calling and emailing, things like that. But once I realized that, okay, I am really good at understanding accounts and hitting people on the right, at the right time with the right messaging, and, and using that, incorporating that to my, my prospect and strategy, my numbers just took off. So that was probably the biggest focus that I, I took a, a hard look at when I was first starting out as a BDR. And like 
similar to what I did as a professional athlete. It's like, I have these weaknesses, which you always have to confront and find a way to improve upon. But like, I'm not going to let anyone be better at me in terms of my prospect and strategy in my process. And, you know, it's even kind of funny, like even thinking about like our, our tool that we have at Sixth Sense, I would have loved having something like that because I had to try and find ways to like do that on my own because I didn't have data around companies that were trying to buy from us. But I was able to affect, at least as a BDR before all this ABM space was kind of building out, I was able to find ways to do that at a high level. And that's kind of how it was effective. And I kind of just built out my overall process as a prospector uh, based upon that. Awesome. So am I correct in assuming, and I'm sorry if I'm incorrect, uh, that senior director of business development means that you're running a team of BDRs or SDRs? Is that accurate? Or, or tell me about your current role. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that's completely accurate. So we have a team located out here uh, on the West Coast as well as the East doing an awesome job. And, and the cool thing I, I will mention, I think I said this earlier, is you know you have a lot of different ways that you can tack leading BDR teams. I think but the core of what I've seen is having a system where you have super strong training and enablement, making sure that you have refined messaging and coaching around objections, et cetera. But also the process is probably my opinion. Maybe that's just my, my uh, focus because it was, was uh, a highlight from my time as a BDR. That's the most important thing that makes running effective teams uh, a focal point. You've mentioned that you think people should stop caring about whether or not SDR teams report to sales or marketing. Walk us through mm -hmm. that. I mean, that is a very, very common uh, debate. Walk us through your perspective on it. Yeah. So, you know, and honestly, especially in the age with account base where everyone's kind of doing that, like everyone fundamentally understands that BDR teams are, they sit very much between sales and marketing and it's actually equal. Like, if you're in a scenario where you're reporting to sales and you know you're as a leader in particular, not even just with the BDRs, you're more aligned with your sales leader and completely neglecting the marketing side where any kind of events, programs, whatever it may be, are not a priority to you, you will get burned by that. If you're on, if you're a BDR reporting to the marketing side and you're not taking a look at how how well your accounts are converting into opportunities or closed business or a lot of the, the issues that you know sales leaders typically care about, you're gonna get burned by that. So BDR leaders need to honestly stand up and take a lot more accountability and realize that similar to when you were a BDR and you had two AEs, you kind of have two AEs right now. One's your sales leader, one's your marketing leader. And if you don't have a strong understanding of both of their pains and kind of what they need to do to be effective, like your your team is going to crumble. And you hear a lot about you hear a lot about people talking about like, you know, if you're poor in marketing, there's no career path, there's no training and onboarding, et cetera. But as a BDR leader, like part of your job is to be a subject matter, subject matter expert on both sales and marketing. So it's your responsibility to make that happen. And I do think that sometimes people tend to just think that they should report to one another. But the reality is, if you're not thinking like both, then you're going to hurt your team. What a great perspective. I love it. And you're right that the, the, the most common piece of feedback for why SDR should report to sales is that they all aspire to be account executives and, and nobody aspires or maybe there just aren't enough jobs in marketing. But maybe what you're saying is maybe there is a career path in marketing if you're sophisticated enough SDR and you really understand messaging and positioning and your ICP and all that. 100%. And for me, I've reported into both. Currently at Sixth Sense, we actually reported marketing. I can confidently say that some of our BDRs that have progressed into account executive roles are crushing it right now. And a lot of that stems from the fact that when you come to Sixth Sense as a BDR, from your onboarding all the way through your time on our team, we have training in place to help you learn how to sell. And that's something that, like, you know, I, I report into marketing. It wasn't something that was technically driven strictly from a marketing agenda, but knowing what it takes to be a, a successful AE, I have to make sure my team has the resources to get that done. And um, that's something that sometimes BDR leaders don't necessarily take as a priority, but is absolutely necessary uh, if you want to have your team move forward and become AEs. Awesome. So, you know, we're, we're on the, I wish I could say the tail end. We're on the, we're in some part of a global pandemic. Maybe it's the end of chapter one. You know, Winston Churchill said it's not the end of the end and it's not the beginning, but it is the end of the beginning. So I don't know what period of the global pandemic we're in, but I know that you've been running an SDR team, a BDR team through this entire movement from being in the office and everybody working, you know, full steam ahead to working from home, uh, a bunch of industries being massively hard hit, everybody adjusting to a new normal. How has your team been doing over the last couple of months? And what are some of the, 
you know, what, what has worked what, in terms of outreach, in terms of generating meetings and pipeline, what are some tactics that you found across the team that you run that actually have, have helped generate new business for Sixth Sense? Yeah, sure. So I guess culturally, I'll talk about that first. And, and I have to admit, so when all this started happening with, with COVID, uh, my wife and I were expecting, I actually just had triplets. <laughs> so it was a fraternity oh for God. God. <laughs> wow. so, <laughs> Yeah, so my, my hair is graying really quickly with everything going on. So I honestly was not a part of a lot of the stuff that happened around messaging and adjustments during the initial phases of COVID. So I can't really talk about that. But one thing that is tried and true, always a priority with us at Sixth Sense, uh, especially within my team, is our culture. Every single week during our team meetings, every single week during one-on-ones, we really enforce that. So the whole purpose of that is being a BDR is really hard. And not to say that these kinds of things will happen. Obviously, this is something on a whole you know, different level. But you want to prepare your team culturally to be able to weather any kind of storm. So that's the reason why, without fail, we always go through our, our culture within our team meeting, which is our, we call it our, our acronym of family. So fun, accountability, and mindfulness, integrity, love, yes. So without a doubt, every single week, we have someone on the team talk through one other person who exemplified our family culture best. And it kind of brings our team together and reinforces the fact that, yeah, sometimes things are hard. Sometimes things aren't going to go the way we want to, but we're a family. We do everything together. We all take care of each other. So culturally, that's been a priority and it's helped us weather the storm. Like I've seen numerous situations where people on my team kind of throw ad hoc meetings together just to talk just to share ideas, just to check in on how people are doing. It's because it's what ex- it's expected of us and also kind of more or less of what's ingrained in them. And I guess if you want to kind of get into the tactics of how, of how we've been effective, again, not to <laughs> talk too much about success, but you know, using our product right now more than ever is critical. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, having the ability to know like which companies are researching you, which companies are researching for your competitors, which companies are searching for your certain product keywords and being able to focus on those accounts in particular has been a game changer. And I would even challenge if anyone wants us to kind of talk through this from their own perspective, we have a portion of our website where uh, you can kind of go in there and take a look at Fill out a form, basically, to take a look at the accounts that are displaying that kind of activity for you. So at least as a salesperson, you can know who wants to actually buy from you. But tactically, we have doubled down on the fact that you know our process has to be focused on that because we know that that gives us our best shot. And if, if we're going to blindly go after an account just because we think there's a great opportunity as opposed to them actually showing intent around that, it doesn't make very much sense. Yeah, well, I agree. And for folks out there, if you're just to provide a little more detail, you know, Sixth Sense provides intent data, which is basically they have relationships with publishers and websites and all this other stuff. So that when people are actively searching for your category, searching for your company before they even become a lead, that's what Sixth Sense and my friend Latney calls the dark funnel, right? They haven't filled out a form. You don't even know that they're a lead, but they're out there in market doing research. That's the moment at which you want to reach out to them. So when Ernest is talking about, reaching those buyers at the right moment. That's what he's talking about. I want to just go back to that acronym. You said it super fast. What does it stand for? The the thing that you recite as yeah. part of your values? Yeah, sure. So family, which stands for fun, accountability, mindfulness, integrity, love. Yes. And we've identified that as a company, but also as a BDR team, that's what we need to do to take care of each other. That's what we need to do to be successful. So we're constantly looking for individuals on our team that are exemplifying that and doing our best to highlight it. Because to the point I made earlier, like when things like this happen, and granted, it'll never be this bad. I mean, hopefully not, you never know. But when things get bad, having strong culture, and that's something that I probably learned from um, the athletic background in football, uh, is having the strong culture is what's going to get you through everything. And um, even when the times are good, we have to reinforce it just to prepare us for when things aren't as good. Absolutely. Do you know, I don't know if you know about this, but there's a, there's a very famous Netflix culture deck. And in it, they talk repeatedly about how they're not a family, they're a team. Has that ever come up at Sixth Sense about the, about, you know, and you have love as one of the, the letters in the acronym? I personally, I personally strongly agree with your approach, but there's always been a debate that you need to kind of remind people that this is a, an earned place to be at the company, that, you know, it's conditional upon their performance. And as a consequence, we're a team, not a family. Have you all ever addressed that at Sixth Sense? Yeah, that's a good call out. Um, I wouldn't say we've necessarily addressed that. But one thing is that accountability piece is pretty encompassing of a lot of things. Accountability means you're that person who's literally hitting your number. You're doing the tasks that are asked of you. You're taking care of people that, the way that they need to be to be successful. So yeah, part of this is earned. Like, you know, 
part of being on our team means that you need to hit your number. You need to be accountable for our overall team goal. And if you're not, then you can't be a part of the team. So I think it's maybe not quite like what you're talking about, but I do agree that that is something that you should take a look at. And for us, that accountability piece kind of solves that problem for us. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your, uh, your approach. You know, the people that are always saying it's a team, not a family, I feel like they're always kind of reminding you that you can be fired. And it's like, yeah, we know <laughs> you don't have to hit me over the head with it a million times. I understand I can be fired. Um, <laughs> I want to, <laughs> I want to switch topics a little bit. I have one question and then I want to talk about some of your efforts to, you know, to support underrepresented groups and to be a leader within the black community and within the broadly defined sales community. But one question I just have, and, and uh, this is a bit sensitive, so I apologize in advance, but you were a football player. I'm always mm-hmm. curious about, and I was a football player in high school too, not at your level, but you know, I love the game of football. Absolutely love it. And mm-hmm. uh, I love the strategy and I love that, you know, each play is, um, is like the special construction. It's almost like art, you know, to figure out how to exploit mm-hmm. the defense's weaknesses. Meanwhile, though, when I was, um, growing up and uh, the evidence about traumatic brain uh, injury Mm -hmm. and just about the impact that football has on, on your life expectancy was not as prevalent. And it's become much more prevalent as you emerged as a great high school and college football player. How did you, Mm -hmm. how did you think about that or rationalize that? Was that, did that not come into your head at all? Was it, did that have an impact on your decision to retire? Just curious. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And to be completely transparent with you, and I think that this is probably the mentality of what helps people get to the NFL is you kind of have to just be relentless and um, put yourself in situations that a lot of people maybe wouldn't. And I can pretty confidently say that it wasn't until I left football that I realized how bad it actually was. And interestingly enough, it wasn't up until my first interview that I realized that. When I was interviewing for the company I was working at, uh, when I first started out called Persado, I had never sold before, so they asked me to basically sell them something. So I did a whole presentation around concussions and and because I was going to sell them a helmet. And when I started doing the research on it, I was like, oh my, what? Like, this is what I was doing in my body for all these years. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, geez. Ernest, was, buddy. Yeah. But you know what? That's how we're, that's how football players are trained. You're trained to ignore the elements. You're trained to, to not consider what you're actually going to be doing to yourself. And so, honestly, it's a bummer. It's a bummer because, like, I think a lot of football players are blind to, like, what they're actually doing because they want to achieve greatness. They want to get to the next level. Um, and be as successful as possible. And I can say I was a victim of that. And it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that research and developments will continue to go in place. So you will not have athletes that will be playing like how some athletes are right now. But um, I can say, I, I wish I had known what I know now. And I'm, I can also comment that if, you know, my kids decide to play football or they want to make that decision, I'll probably have to step in and say that that's not something that's going to happen because it's not safe and it's not something that um, I would personally recommend. Wow. So yeah. just playing and, and that if, back, what you just said, you're not going to let your kids play football. I will not. And I can, I can also even comment on that. A lot of my former teammates would probably agree with me. Damn. Um, the people that, that, a lot of the people that have, because we've seen the other side of it. We've seen people that have played from Pop Warner all the way through for like 15, 20 year careers of what's happened to them. Of some people like even struggling to hold conversations because of the brain trauma they've had. And a lot of people don't have as much exposure into that. And it's, um, it's really unfortunate, but it's it's just a bummer of what the sport can actually do with you to you, and I, I don't think it'd be something I want my kids to do. You think it would? Is it possible to make it touch? Is that possible no. to retain the spirit of it and just not have I it be tackled? I don't think so. And to be completely honest on that as well, people like the violence. People like to see people get hit. People like to see those monster collisions, and it won't be the same sport. I I just don't yeah. see it going down that path. Yeah. Well. Well, uh, you know, thanks for your service, I guess is how, you know, (laughs) I mean, it's still an incredible, it's an absolutely incredible to make it to the NFL and you've competed at the very highest level and that, um, that's awesome. So, uh, I salute you. Last topic we want to talk about, uh, is, is, is perhaps the most controversial or, or I don't know if, you know, it is, but let's hear your perspective. You know, first of all, you're a professional athlete, but you're also a black man. What's it been like? First of all, as you've commented, tech has very few black leaders. Did, were you aware of that? And I'm also thinking about, you know, the NFL, football. Football you're, is much more diverse, right? Football, you're surrounded by other black 
strong black men leaders that are that are performing incredibly well at their craft you go into the tech world you see so many fewer people how did that impact you did it impact you and how has it shaped what you're doing now in terms of giving back to the community yeah sure so i can say that initially it did impact me and it's kind of one of those things where like as a black person as a black man in this country i have to kind of like allow myself to be okay in environments where I'm not like everyone else. Now that can be challenging when you're not as confident in what you're doing. And the reality is any person of color that joins a tech company where they're the extreme minority, they face that in certain ways. Because all you're doing when you first start out, especially as a, a new BDR, new career, trying to get your feet on the ground, all you're looking for is for ways to be confident. And if you don't look like everyone else, that definitely doesn't help you. So initially, I, I will say that, you know, I was a little bit apprehensive and kind of nervous of what that would be like. I think fortunately, the company I was working at, they had a pretty good system in place and they were hired with diversity in mind. So that felt a little bit good. But it is a challenge. And it, it's it's really, I know a lot of companies are trying to do their best to solve the problem and to, to put the right in place to, to find ways to eliminate disparity. But you know, the reality is for anyone that kind of has to go through it, it's really tough. And what I've personally done to like kind of help solve this is first off, you know, even talking with a couple of, of social sellers across the industry, we've actually created a Slack group where anyone who's listening to this, uh, a person of color, if you would please send me a LinkedIn uh, message, I can add you to it. But it's basically a community on Slack of uh, primarily black men and women in tech sales where we can just talk about our experiences, share everything and be a sounding board for each other. So especially with everything going on right now, that community has been absolutely amazing. So first and foremost, creating some kind of environment where you can kind of be free and be yourself and talk and share your experiences with others kind of like you is really helpful. But, you know, I think the bigger question that I'm sure a lot of people are trying to solve is like, how can I find a way to get more candidates? How can I find a way to solve this diversity problem at my company? You know, the reality is it requires some work. Like there are a lot of, I mean, I've worked with companies like SV Academy where the primary goal of what they try to do is, is source underrepresented individuals into tech companies. I've actually mentored with them for the past, I guess, three or four years. So if you're looking for a tangible resource to try and find, especially BDR, who eventually you would hope become great AEs and eventual sales leaders, SVA, SV Academy is an awesome resource to do that. So I've doubled down with them consistently with the teams that I've had. We've always had extremely diverse teams because you need that to be successful. But you know, it's hard. And I'm not going to be blind to the fact that a lot of people do want to solve the problem, but don't necessarily have the resources. What I eventually, you know, I essentially encourage everyone to do is to like actually go out and try and find them because they are there. There are communities out there. There are people that want to help and they, there are people that want to push the right candidates over that will be effective and also kind of help the diversity problem. You just got to really spend some time to do it and look for it. Yeah, that's true. Well, and uh, you know, too many people I run, uh, I run a community called Revenue Collective. We're doing we're doing research on this right now and surveying people every week. And basically, you know, nobody has developed direct rela- SV Academy has a few, and we're partners with them as well. But nobody has developed direct relationships with the HBCUs, which is like an obvious thing to do. Just you know, reach out to Howard and a bunch of other schools and uh, begin doing on campus recruiting at a minimum. You know, that's like at least something. Somebody, some people can do if they care about this issue. One hundred percent, and that's relatively easy to do. So, again, and, and that kind of goes back to what I was talking about. Like, there are ways to solve this. I just think that it gets difficult, and people deprioritize it because they can't find those answers. But if you can get creative, yeah, you can make it happen. Well, it's all, it's a long term thing. It's not like you're not going to do it in a day. It's not going to be a blog post, which leads me to my my next question for you. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of a debate on LinkedIn. Or maybe there's just a broader debate in the world about there's certain people that, you know, everything's happening with protests, with obviously in response to the murder of George Floyd, even though there have been more murders since then. And there's a group of companies, mine included, that have come out and said, listen, we stand with Black Lives Matter. We are we want to promote equality. We stand behind the protesters. There's another group of people that don't quite say that they're not in favor of uh, Black Lives Matter, but they say this is all what they would call virtue signaling. Like we're all kind of playing like we're, um, you know, sensitive and open minded and we care about diversity for the moment because that's what's in the headlines. And then we'll all forget about it, you know, in a couple of weeks and go back to doing whatever we normally do. And um, I guess I'm just curious how, how you feel about that, you know, and when you see companies come out and say, you know, they change their logo and they make it, 
black or they the Instagram thing where everybody like does that do you appreciate that? Do you view those people as allies or do you do you roll your eyes? Mm-hmm. Have you been, you know, conditioned to believe that like, you know what, I'll I'll believe it when I see it. These people are all full of shit. What's your what's your perspective? Yeah, and honestly it's a tough one. And you know, <sighs> The way I kind of look at it is if you look back on what's happened over the past 400 years, there has been progress, a ton of progress, sometimes more progress than people give this country credit for. So I look at that as like as a sign of hope, but also recognizing that like these things are so institutionalized that they will not be solved with Instagram posts. They will not be solved today, I should say, with companies going out and giving their message. But those those forms of communication plant seeds. It, it starts to help people realize, you know, at a smaller level in time, more and more, like how important it is to recognize how difficult it can be as a black person in this country. So I do in some ways agree that, you know, some people are saying that, yeah, you're going to talk about it now and post about it now, but you're going to forget about it. But I'm also conscious of the fact that like those seeds, are, those are seeds that are being planted for the future. And like, I don't know if I'll, I'll live in a society where people truly recognize the impact of racism and uh you know black people have complete and true equality but i can confidently say that as long as people keep taking these steps it's going to slowly start building into our institution and whether that's this generation the next or even the next after that we'll have a much better place for people of color to live in here here i agree with you you know the uh, I, this is my personal rant i shouldn't bother you with it but the phrase virtue signaling is actually a very toxic pernicious phrase because what you're saying is you're calling out people that are saying something that is evidently evidently virtuous right you're saying the people that are saying that good thing they don't really mean it which it like yep. it doesn't really it's not where to it's not clear where to go from there you know what i mean like okay well should they should they not say anything should they yeah. say bad things it seems like the people that are anyway that's my i'll stop from there um <laughs> <laughs> Ernest, it's been awesome having you uh, on the show, and uh, I really appreciate this conversation. Let's say uh, we want to follow the path of Ernest Owusu, and we want to know what's influenced you, what books you've read, what podcasts you're listening to, what content, what leaders, you know, what great leaders or mentors you've had in your life that you think we should know about. When we think about following the breadcrumb trail, where would you have it lead us? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think any good salesperson you have to be a master of your craft. That kind of goes back to what I learned uh, from my NFL career to what I transitioned on to sales. Uh, so in terms of books, definitely never see the difference. Fanatical so prospecting, challenger sale, transparency, so all of that. I like just um, completely immerse yourself in that. I think in terms of what I've seen on social, Morgan Ingram has been absolutely awesome. I remember like even when I was transitioning out of the BDR role and managing teams, I've always kind of followed him on LinkedIn, listened to some of his podcasts to try and get a sense tactically of what to do. Um, and I guess in terms of, of mentors, I've, I've always had a tribe of mentors that I've always kind of just hung my hat on. And one thing I would encourage everyone to do is if you find your tribe of mentors and make sure they're diverse and, and helping you and helping guide you towards where you want to go. The three people that I chose, uh, Chris Ram, Chris Casalini, and Brian Remington, they're all on three completely different paths. But I, I reach out to them periodically with just basic questions on building out my team, uh, processes, et cetera. And I always get a completely different perspective. And that's what helps me be effective. But you always need some kind of tribe of mentors. I just encourage everyone to have them uh, be a little bit different. Makes sense. So, and the books, Fanatical Prospecting, um, uh, mm-hmm. Never Split the Difference, The Challenger Sale, and then you, uh, and then The Transparency Sale by Todd Capone, uh, which is a newer, exactly. a newer addition to the canon. But good job to Todd for making it on that list. Ernest, a few people want to reach out, I'm sure, to join your Slack community. Other people want to reach out to become customers of Sixth Sense, and other people want to reach out to just get to know you. What's, the, what's your preferred method of communication? How should people yeah, reach out definitely. to you? Yeah, definitely. So LinkedIn, Ernest Owusu, and I guess kind of on both those things, if you're a person of color who wants to connect with other Blacks in sales, especially in tech sales, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I will send you a link. Uh, if you're trying to learn a little bit more about Sixth Sense, as I mentioned on our website, we have a portion where you basically fill out a form and we can literally show you which companies are researching your competitors, your brand name, also your keywords. Please reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. I will send you that link. I can get you set up to show you what that information looks like. Awesome. Uh, Ernest, thanks for being on the show. And we'll talk to you on Friday for Friday Fundamentals. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. It's Sam's Corner. Loved that conversation with Ernest Owusu. 
Here's a couple things that, you know, maybe you can take away. First of all, just the commitment to be a professional athlete is something, it's just something so difficult that we really need to tip our caps to people, particularly somebody like Ernest who managed to make this transition from the pro, you know, from the NFL to basically starting at the bottom when it comes to technology sales and being, you know, the celebrated professional athlete and then the humility to say, you know what, I need to work my way up in the corporate world and I'm going to do that, frankly, as, as an SDR. And now, of course, he's running a team. So I just love that commitment. I love the humility. And of course, you know, there's something about about sports and about getting great at any skill, which we can apply to sales. We talked about this in Habits at Work, uh, the Habits at Work conversation with Andrew Sykes a couple of weeks ago, which is practice treat sales like you like it is a sport and you are an athlete and you need to work on your game and work on the small pieces of your game the small the moves the subtle moves that help you move a conversation along that help you communicate with the prospect but treat your discipline like a sport and practice it every day and and importantly practice it with a coach right and make sure that you're getting feedback all of the time and feedback from somebody that is also an expert so that you can embody and embrace the best skills that are possible. Of course, you know, Ernest is, is a black man. And I think it's also important just to call out the fact that there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done when it comes to celebrating black leaders in corporate America and making sure that they rise up through the ranks and they represent at the executive level the faces of the world, right? And that it's not just white men at the very, very top, but that we've got all kinds of different people from all kinds of different backgrounds. And so I'm excited for Ernest's continued growth, both at Sixth Sense and Corporate World, because I'm sure he's going to be Chief Revenue Officer and a CEO at some point in the future, just knowing how hard he works and how much commitment he brings to it. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Always love it when we've got people from from different backgrounds uh, coming on the show. And we've got, we've got a couple of great episodes coming up uh, with folks also from even different backgrounds in the NFL. We've got a conversation with somebody that was a, a special operations army professional uh, that has been to hotspots all over the world and taking those lessons and how to apply those to a career in sales. And that's a conversation with my friend, uh, Stephen Brody. So we've got a lot of great stuff coming up. If you want to reach me, you can. It's linkedin.com forward slash the word in forward slash Sam F. Jacobs. You can also email me, Sam at revenuecollective.com. If you haven't checked out Revenue Collective, it's a community of about 2,500 executives and up and coming top performers across the individual contributor, manager and director levels. And we are helping people every day. We're bringing people together by city, by function, by geography, by time zone, by interest level. We're making one-on-one -on -one connections and we're helping people grow in their careers. So, so far so good. It's been, uh, we've gotten great feedback so far. And if you'd like to learn more, go to revenuecollective.com. And without further ado, I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>